So in these two lectures, we're going to look at dislocations of major joints, discussing the anatomy of the joints, the factors that contribute to stability, um, the injuries that are particularly associated with instability of the joint, and any neurovascular complications that might arise from joint dislocations. So by the end of the talk, you'll be able to talk about joint stability and the anatomical structure of the joint in relation to its stability. Mechanisms of instability with dislocation. Mechanisms of dislocation and the main types of dislocation of each joint and neurovascular complications that may be associated with, with the different joint dislocations. Here's the first case, a 25-year-old basketball player with a dislocated shoulder. So for each of these joints, we're going to think about the usual mechanism of dislocation, the main structures that stabilize the joint and thus prevent dislocation, injuries associated with dislocations of joints that may cause instability and the nerves and vessels that are most likely associated with these dislocations or nerve vessel injuries. So you might want to pause the video and see if you can work this out yourself for this shoulder injury. Okay, so the shoulder girdle is made up of several joints, the glenohumeral, acromioclavicular, sternoclavicular and scapulothoracic joints. And the combination of these joints gives the shoulder its very wide mobility as well as its strength. We're going to focus on the glenohumeral joint, which is a ball and socket joint, the glenoid itself being a fairly shallow socket, and therefore the shoulder has high mobility but at the expense of low stability. The structures that improve stability around the joint include the rotator cuff muscles, the glenoid labrum, and the acromioclavicular articulation. So just to remind ourselves, of the rotator cuff muscles. These include the supraspinatus, infraspinatus, subscapularis, and teres minor muscles. In addition to the rotator cuff muscles, stability is further enhanced by the glenoid labrum which is mostly cartilaginous and increases the depth of the glenoid fossa, thus increasing stability of the joint. And the acromioclavicular articulation, which is superior to the um, glenohumeral joint, but provides stability from a um, forceful upward movement of the humeral head. For example, if you fall onto the stretch hand. The most common mechanism of injury of the shoulder joint is hyperabduction and hyperextension which tends to lead to an anterior dislocation. So by far the commonest dislocation we see is anterior and this is you know for example a, a basketballer raising his hand above his head and it had been pushed backwards behind him. Um, same thing you can see with footballers and rugby players. Occasionally you see posterior dislocations due to forceful internal rotation of the shoulder joint either in patients with seizures or in patients with severe electrical injuries. The instability is usually due to either tears of the rotator cuff and anterior joint capsule or associated injuries to the glenoid labrum such as the 
seen in bunk heart injuries. The nerves commonly affected by anterior dislocations include the axillary and radial nerves, much more the axillary nerve. And really, these bo both of these nerves are part of the um, posterior cord, which is in direct contact with the anterior surface of the joint. And therefore, when the joint dislocates, it puts pressure and traction on those nerves. Similarly, the axillary artery is sometimes affected, but less so. This could lead to arterial spasm or sometimes even arterial tears. Second case is an 18-year-old female who presents with a swollen del elbow after a fall onto the outstretched hand. Again, have a look at the questions and see if you can answer them. Pause the video, answer the questions, and then we'll move on. <clears throat> so the elbow joint is a combined hinge and pivot joint. The articulation between the trochlea and the collacranon fossa forms the hinge, whereas the articulation between the radius, the radial head, and the capitellum forms the pivot. So the hinge joint is responsible for flexion extension of the elbow, while the pivot joint is responsible for supination and pronation. Much of the stability of the elbow is due to the bony structure, the deep Olecranon fossa holds the trochlea quite snugly, and this is further reinforced by the coronary process anteriorly, and that's the anterior lip of the proximal ulna, which again reduces the risk of uh, movement of the trochlea out of the olecranon fossa. Lateral movement is somewhat limited, um, is, is, is somewhat stabilized, sorry by the um, radio capital articulation. This stability is further enhanced by the medial and collateral ligaments of the elbow and um, dynamic stability is provided by the muscles that cross the elbow joint, so the extensors and flexors of the elbow joint. The most common type of dislocation seen in the elbow is the posterior or posterior lateral dislocation and this is usually due to a fall onto the outstretched hand. Anterior dislocations are less common and may be due to hyperextension injuries of the elbow. So most unstable elbow dislocations are due to associated fractures. If we think back to what we said with stability, the structures that provide stability, fractured or dislocated, can lead to instability. So fractures of the radial head, fractures of the coronoid process, fractures of the olecranon. The commonest nerve affected by elbow dislocation is the ulnar nerve, then the medial nerve. Radial nerves can be affected as well, but less commonly. And the brachial artery can also be affected, particularly if there's a lot of swelling and compartment syndrome. Finally, we have a patient with a wrist injury. So again, see if you can answer the questions. Pause the video and then when you're ready, we can move on. Just before we move on, just to point out that this x-ray shows a perilunate dislocation. The lunate is still articulating with the distal radius but the rest of the corpus, including the capitate, is displaced dorsally. The wrist is made up of the radiocarpal joint, the distal radioulnar joint, and then the midcarpal joint. A lot of the stability is formed via the bones of the corpus, particularly the um, proximal carpal row, which consists of the scaphoid, lunate and triquetrium, as well as the ligaments, which can be divided into the extrinsic and intrinsic carpal ligaments. The extrinsic carpal ligaments will include the 
dorsal and vula radioulnar ligaments and the dorsal and palmar extrinsic carpal ligaments including the radioscaphalunate and radiotriquetral ligaments. The intrinsic ligaments such as the scaphalunate and lunotriquetral ligament and the triangular fibrocartilage complex also play a part in joint stability. Most wrist injuries are due to a fall onto the outstretched hand and instability is associated with either ligamentous disruption or associated fractures. So for example, um, disruption of the distal radio ulnar joint or injuries to the vola and the dorsal radiocarpal complexes, the collateral ligaments or the intrinsic carpal ligaments such as the scapul unit or lunotriquetral or the TFCC. Um, body injuries can also cause instability, particularly bony fractures associated with perilunate dislocations. So, for example, perilunate dislocations associated with scaphoid fractures, fractures of the capitate, or fractures of the triquetrium. The most commonly affected nerve in these injuries is the median nerve due to compression within the carpal tunnel, but these injuries may also cause quite severe swelling and be associated with compartment syndrome as well. So that was a quick look at the major joints of the upper limb. Um, if you have any questions, you can bring them up in class. In summary, we looked at the anatomy of major joints, mechanism of dislocation, causes of instability and neurovascular complications. Thank you.